Too much reality in a picture is always a disappointment to the imaginative soul. We love suggestion and not hard fact. Artist and author, John F. Carlson. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Anne Blair Brown describes herself as a contemporary impressionist. She is drawn to impressionism because it's an interpretation of a moment in time. Light is the subject of her paintings. The light that imbues her paintings radiates a feeling of warmth. Light glows in an open doorway, shadows accentuate warm afternoon sunlight, and dapples of light dance upon a picnic table in the summer shade of an old oak tree. Anne's play of light is found in her rural and urban landscapes, her figurative work, and her intimate interior spaces. As you peer into Anne's paintings, you begin to sense it as if it were your own memory. Her broken brush strokes begin a story that only you, as the viewer, can complete. The sense of place and memory Anne suggests in her beautiful paintings becomes your story. In this edition of The Artful Painter, Anne freely shares her thoughts on her process of creating light-filled impressionistic paintings. She talks about her joy of teaching and how we as students can most benefit from artist workshops and training. Anne discusses, too, her experiences with showing her work in galleries. Now, you'll want to get out your pen and notebook and prepare to take notes. I know I took a lot of notes in this conversation. Other artists have told me that I need to talk to Anne Blair Brown. Well... I'm glad I took their advice, and today I'm happy to share with you our conversation in this episode. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. So, Anne, you live in Nashville. I do. That's a real happening place uh, with, with the arts, not just music. I mean, most people think of music, but there's uh, there's a large uh, art community there. There is. And we're, we are so blessed with, with a large um, community of excellent painters. It's actually very interesting how many of my contemporaries are nationally known and they all born and bred in Nashville. We're very proud of that fact. Well, that's that's great. It's a beautiful place. I love the state of Tennessee. It's it's Thank awesome. You. Yeah. So you call yourself a contemporary impressionist, and this this fascinates me because uh, impressionism is is something that I guess starting in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, it just seems like people have been drawn to it. What draws you to impressionism? I really like the mystery of broken brushstrokes. I love I love for when I personally look at a painting, I like to search. I like to maybe uh, piece together some things for myself, and that engages me in the painting rather than someone just, you know, photorealistically translating a subject, which is a skill in and of itself, and I applaud it. But for me, I, I just continually want to give less information with more impact, and those are the kind of paintings that I enjoy looking at. So that's sort of what comes out of me. It's harder than it looks, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it keeps me awake at night. <laughs> Still, it, well, it, you know, how do I how do I simplify this, abstract it, um, especially when you're looking at a scene that's got so much information and it's it's a lifelong pursuit. It's nothing to conquer in a day. I, I trust me on that. <laughs> I'm the poster child for that. Um but yeah, and you know, the word impressionist gets thrown around a lot, but for me, it's literal, literal in terms of, I would like to share my impression of something. I do not want to copy it. And your impressions are, are not limited to just one subject matter or uh, uh, genre. You, as when I was looking at your work, I saw rural landscapes. There were scenes of interior places, which I really liked the, the, the play you. of light. So light seems to be a very important part of your art. Yes, and life imitates art, art imitates life, however you want to say it. Um, aren't we always searching for the light? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the illumination, the the answers. That's the deeper answer to that question. But what I'm interested in is 
it, atmosphere and and that means and and light and that means that everything I look at is a painting and when I first started out you know the goal was oh to get in galleries and this is a living and you know yada yada and um, so I painted one thing and and was very interested in it and then I just started looking in my own backyard and once you once you see light and pattern and shapes more than the stuff that's when you have to paint everything. And I, I would be terribly bored to paint one thing. And I can go out in the Tennessee countryside and paint one the same scene over and over, and it's going to be different every minute of every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And that's very exciting to me. And that's just in one little location, but yet yeah, so, you have so, a huge variety in the state of Tennessee. Oh, exactly. And I used to think I had to travel and paint poppies in a Tuscan field to make a beautiful painting. But that was because I was focusing on on subject and not shapes and patterns and what was coming out of my heart, actually. Um, Just thinking, okay, well, this is pretty and it will please people. But when I got more skill and got more mileage, I can paint an alleyway with a trash can. And if I do it right, I can make it beautiful. Yeah, I was I was in uh, a gallery by David Boyd, who was on this podcast earlier. And speaking of alleys and trash cans, yes, <laughs> so you can take an it. old utility light meter and. <laughs> I know, like, it's so good. So how do you do that? I would have never <laughs> thought to do that. You know, <laughs> right? I know. To find beauty in the mundane. Uh, absolutely, and isn't that what we're here for? Isn't that what artists are are here for? Yeah. You know, as it, some people would like to. You know, they have the desire to challenge and shock and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's a different that's OK. That's over there. But, you know, people like David Boyd and myself, we just want to kind of connect with you and say, look how I saw this. Isn't that interesting? Or I hope you think it's interesting. And then we connect. Well, now you you said earlier, if if I heard you correctly, it sound, sounded like there was a, a period of time where you had to go through a mental shift. You, you mentioned yeah. you wanted to get into the galleries and uh, yeah, and that's I mean that's, that's when you start out, you think you know, and I actually I, I have to separate making money and my art, or I can't do it. But at the end of the day, it is my living. And just early on, I found myself for various reasons traveling abroad and finding myself in places that had. And I've always been sort of a foodie, and I actually made a living at being a chef for a while. So restaurants and the glittering glasses and the, the waiters oh, and their wow. finery, all that kind of stuff really appealed to me and was a very romantic subject. And so I painted that for a while and I really enjoyed it. And I look, I haven't done it a lot recently, but I have segued into interior paintings that aren't restaurants, but perhaps just light hitting a chair in, in a normal person's home, you know, nothing grand. It's just interesting how simpler subjects appeal to you the more skill you have as a painter. But having said that, I felt like I didn't want to be pigeonholed and and be, you know, the restaurant lady. I wanted to explore every subject. And, you know, when when you see things as paintings, it's it's you want to paint different subjects. So that's how it just sort of step by step. That's what led me up to where I am now with um, just really wanting everything I see can be a painting. Well, so what helped you to make that? Was there an epiphany or a turning point or or was it a, a gradual buildup as to recognizing you needed to to do that? Oh, I, I think it was a natural progression just from my personality. It's not that you're a, a bad artist if you paint one thing and do it well. That's actually it's probably smart. <laughs> <laughs> um But I think there's in some of us, there is a need for growth that is it transcends the need for oxygen, quite frankly. And I want I I have a a passion and a a burning desire to, you know, every painting I paint, I could paint really beautiful painting. And then I'm thinking, okay, great. Now, now what? You know, I don't I don't spend too long patting myself on the back. So that just that's the impetus for um, curiosity and exploration. How did you develop that interest in painting? I, it found me, Carl. It just, you, you know, I was, as mentioned, I was, I was a chef. I'm as many artists that well, don't. Well, that's an have, art form in itself right there. It is. It is. And I, I continue to love cooking and, and it's more of a hobby now, but I was working in restaurants and, and 
you know, had gone to art school and I guess I just, it wasn't laziness. It was, I just didn't know what to do. And then just, it's like the universe tapped me on the shoulder one day and said, you need to pick up a paintbrush. And I just started painting, drawing on, no pun intended, um, my past, you know, skill set, which wasn't very advanced at the time. And just through the course of practice and literally, I mean, it's almost otherworldly. It's just something said, you've got to do this. Where did you go to art school? I started at the University of Georgia. Oh, okay. And I got a really wonderful um, foundation there. And then um, I left and f- felt like I didn't didn't have any direction. So I actually took a brief stint at MTSU, which is Middle Tennessee State University. And that was the guy that there was one guy teaching and he was kind of, he, he wanted everybody to go straight into abstraction. And I didn't feel like I had the, the, the chops to, to get there first. It was for me, I, I needed the reverse. N- now looking back on it, I would have excelled there, but I, I left early because it wasn't working for me at the time. So then I went to a, a school here that started as a film school and called Watkins Institute. And it was really cool downtown Nashville. And that's where I actually got the skills to apply the foundational elements to painting and actually piece something together and want to show it and sell it. So it was, it was a, a progression. And then, you know, the school of hard knocks. <laughs> followed most, after yeah. That. That's the most expensive university. Anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, but you might as well use the, the, the degree that you get from there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it's just, you know, any artist will tell you this so much goes into it and, One person can look at your painting and think you're brilliant and one person can say horrible things. It's just you got to have thick skin and and the desire to to grow. Now, your artwork, it's it's just absolutely beautiful. And I find that it just when I'm looking, I'd like to see it in real life. That's the disadvantage is uh, I I don't get to see everybody that I talk to their artwork in in real life. But I would love to see it up close. But I I have a feeling that it would it, it, it draws you. I don't, it just draws you in and, and you begin yeah. to ask questions. And it, it seems like you're thinking as an artist, not just about what you want to do, but you're thinking about the viewer in some way. Am I off base with that or? No, I, th- oh, I think you're spot on. And I, I think partially that was unconscious when I first started. Mm. But um, those are the comments I get. I get people say, oh, I want to walk right in there or you've, you, you've created it. So I feel like I'm there a sense of place, a sense of peace. And frankly, that's what I pursue in my own life. So I guess it just comes out. I don't, I can't tell you that I sit at the easel every time and say, okay, I'm going to create peace. And, but (laughs) you know, through, through my desire to, I gravitate toward calm at all times. I just do. And um, it's what I need to get by. So Maybe, yeah, that, that translates into my color harmonies. You don't see a lot of loud colors next to each other in my paintings. Um, so it's it's half half intentional, but it's not something I'm necessarily thinking about as I'm painting. Perhaps it's for me first, and then it then it comes out and it's for you. Well, it's, it's, it's a sharing. Like if uh, you said you were a chef at one time, I, mm-hmm. one thing I like to do is make bread. I'm not very good at it, but I like to do it. But, <laughs> but I don't want to make it just for me. <laughs> right. I want to saw off an end of that artisan bread and, and let somebody, you know, chew yeah. into it and say, oh, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great analogy. And that, that's how I feel about food. And that's how I feel about anything creative, frankly. And uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. And, you know, people ask me, if you come into my house, I don't have any of my own paintings hanging. First of all, I, I would just pick them apart on a minute to minute basis. Oh, okay. But I, 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 it's, you know, it's like I'm fostering them and I want to send them out and give them a home. I don't, I don't want to look at my own artwork all day long. I mean, I do that in the studio and then I, then I want to look at other people's beautiful work. What do you put on your walls then? Well, I am fortunate in that I... I can trade paintings with people. So I have, I have a collection that does include some things I've purchased, but also includes the end result of a connection with a fellow artist. And so, you know, subject matter can vary. It's funny. I tend to have a lot of landscapes by other artists and it's, it's half because I love the outdoors so much. I'd rather be outside than anywhere. 
I feel like the landscape is something that doesn't come as easy to me as say interiors or still lives. So I guess I surround myself with them so I can learn from other people's work. Um, but just generally do, I'm, I'm blessed with a large collection of, of very peaceful, lovely paintings. And you will notice if you saw my collection that there's not a lot of hard lines and hard facts in any of the paintings. Hmm. It's all a lot of beautiful brushwork and shapes and a lot of good fodder for me to learn from. Do you have some personal favorites there? Oh, yeah. I could call out just, just about anybody. Um, I, I collect a lot of my friends, my local friends, uh, namely Dawn Whitelaw, who is, um, I call her my, my silent mentor because she doesn't know it, but I, I pretty much whatever Dawn would do, I try to do. <laughs> She's just a good soul and a, and a fantastic oh, artist yeah. and a fantastic teacher. And um, I have a couple of her paintings. And let's see. I, I actually like to collect my my boyfriend Trey Finney because <laughs> <laughs> I can I can manipulate him into giving me paintings. Well, um, he's whatever another, he's, it takes to get good art. I <laughs> uh, no, no, he's he's a good artist yeah. and he um he's an inspiration to me. Say his name one more time for he's, me. It's Trey Finney, and he Trey is, Finney. Uh, okay, yeah, he's check him out. He's he used to animate for Disney, and he's got incredible drawing skills, but like the rest of us, he would like to, he's working on more abstraction and, um, getting away from rendering things too much. And I'm, I'm fascinated with his journey and I'm very lucky to be able to watch it firsthand. Awesome. Yeah. We play really well off each other that way. I also have some, my favorite artist that, that someone I aspire to, to paint like is Charles Movali. And I mention him all the time and I have a couple of his paintings. I'm thrilled to have been able to acquire some, to have people that, you know, completely reached the bar. He passed on about three years ago. I, I had had the opportunity to meet him, which I was so grateful for, but he's the real deal. And um, it's fascinating to have his art hanging on my walls. That's beautiful. It's something I want to do more of. I've heard several artists say the same thing. They collect other artists' artworks. Well, it's lonely enough being an artist. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. I literally, I've been working on a show and last couple of days, I literally did not leave the house. And I mean, delightfully so. I wasn't trying not to, but I just was painting and painting. But having these paintings hanging in my house they're like friends. There's not a day goes by that I don't scrutinize over one, two, three, four of them and, and look at them close, far away. It's just it's just what I do. As we were talking about earlier, you do paint a wide variety of subjects and you have started uh, doing interiors, uh, which are, uh, you know, show a beautiful effect of light. Uh, and I just want to know how if you could walk us through your design process and your choices. How do you choose what you want to paint? And then what you have that white canvas staring before you, what do you do? Where do you go from there? That's a great question. You know, it, it can be elusive sometimes. I hear that a lot from my students. You know, how do you know what to paint? I think when you start out, you, you go with subject and then you want to draw the subject and, that's your painting. But the more mileage you have, the more you start looking at shapes and the air around the stuff. The, the short response is I usually get inspired by some form of light, whether it's strong light hitting an object or just a mood that it, with the absence of the sun, it, it doesn't matter. It can be equally as beautiful. And I really actually have a very structural way I paint that has become intuitive I think if you see an artist and they're just slapping paint down and you think, wow, they make it look so easy. I guarantee you 99.9% .9 of the time there's a method there or a fusion of methods that has allowed that artist to construct a painting and, you know, execute it the way they, they envisioned. So I actually be just, you know, because when I first started out, I, values confuse me. The darker and the lighter parts of painting confused me because all I saw was color. Some might say, well, if you've got the right color, you've got the right value. But that just really tripped me up. So what I tend to do is lay in a monochromatic foundation and I sort of draw or morph the scene, however you want to say, in a monochromatic fashion, just sort of pulling out the darkest darks, the lightest lights. And when I'm finished with that, what I call just sort of a wash, 
I vaguely see the scene and I have a template to mix color from at that point. So I sort of separate the value and the color first. And um, besides the design of everything in terms of composition, that's really one of the biggest foundations of my work. And I, I vary it. I vary the color of the wash. I vary how far I go with it, whether it's a little more drawn or a little more um, abstract. But that's my template. That's my springboard to get into what I call the fun stuff, which is color and brushwork. Well, you anticipated my question. I was wondering, you know, did you have a particular color for the for the wash? Yeah, it depends on the mood. And originally I started doing it thinking, well, if I use... You know, I, I, I watched or, or studied, you know, the old masters and the um, process of the grisaille painting, which is putting grays in and building the values and then painting color. And that is similar to the, the thought process of understanding the structural value foundation of the scene before you think about color. It's, it has to do with the mood. If I'm painting outside and it's morning, I might wash in with yellow ochre. And you're, you might be thinking, how do you get darks with ochre? Well, you do. It's just relative to, to each each value within a color. So back to the, the old masters thing, I one day thought, you know, I look at raw linen and I like the look of that. And I thought, well, what if I just mix like a ultramarine and a sienna together and made sort of a grayish, reddish gray or whatever. And I started playing with that. And that that was a good color to start with because, or color mix, because I could get really dark darks, but that's just one of a million ways to approach it. And sometimes I, I air more on the burnt sienna. And then I've got this sort of, once I start scumbling and maybe mushing out a little bit with a paper towel, I have this sort of reddish glow. And that is something that, that can actually, even when covered up can show through and create kind of a light and a mood and a glow. Yeah, I'm looking at a painting. It's called "Come In." It's eleven by fourteen. Yes. On your and, and that's what it looks. Like. It's got this glow to it. <laughs> it just yeah. it's emanating the the summer heat and the and the light. Uh, well, I, know I don't know if it's summer or not, but that's what I feel. You know, when I see it. Right, and these are you know these are for lack of a better word, there's there's tricks. You know, there's ways that you can create these these atmospheric changes these glow this you know the way you use light and aside from the the first wash i use the other thing that you're seeing is layering of warm and cool colors so in the white of that building i might have overstated the white as you know more yellow to be simple and then i can go over it with a cooler color and if i don't blend it but i lay it on top of each other and maybe leave the bottom showing through a lot it starts to vibrate and it's very subtle, very subtle and, and not something everybody would notice, but that's something I do a lot to create vibration is, is cool over, over warm. I'll provide a okay. link to this painting so that people can see what we're talking okay. about. Yeah. So I see the, the sunlit side. It looks like it's underpainted with a br uh, kind of a lemon mm -hmm. uh, yellow and then mm -hmm. a, a cooler white is scumbled or, or a stroke across it, but you allow the yellow to come through. Right. Yeah. And that's intentional. I like to overstate, especially, you know, people, one of the, one of the things I learned, I've taken a lot of workshops over the years and I, I can always kind of give you one takeaway line from each workshop that, that has helped my art. And years and years and years ago, early two thousands, I took a workshop from a fabulous artist named Kim English and I, I guarantee you most of your audience knows who he is. And he said, White is not light. And so when when you see a white building in sunlight and you take out your titanium white, that is you're putting chalk down and it does not vibrate. It does not resonate. And it, it you can definitely get contrast. But the feeling of light doesn't have much to do with the color white, in my opinion. So that that's when I started playing with vibration. It's 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 a wonderful effect. Uh, and then Thank you. Then the, you, in the shadows, for, for example, it's the the warm underpainting there shines through the blue and the purpley. Uh, isn't that a very precise color, purpley? <laughs> I got yeah. that. I got that from my <laughs> my, my granddaughter. Says that she says I'm. This is a little purpley. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I like it. No, you're you're correct. And I when I do the underpainting, I am not averse to 
having the, um, if it's typically, I use such a thin wash that it evaporates and dries before I lay paint on top, but sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's okay that it might even blend in. And so therefore a lot of my cool colors might have some warmth resonating in them just because of the underpainting showing through or, or blending in. It just, it's all serendipitous and those things. And I'll lay a stroke and you know, my, my whole painting process is about making a brush stroke count. So if I lay it down and it looks good to me, I leave it, you know, it, it doesn't matter if color A blended into color B, if it's right, I'm leaving it. Or if it looks right, I'm leaving it. So, um, that's the serendipitous part of painting, just yeah. letting it, letting it, you know, letting well, it, you, talk it, it, it sounds like you land in a lot of amazing places then. That's just, that's great. I think. <laughs> When I'm in a, when I'm in the zone, I mean, every, yeah. any artist will tell you there's days when it's like, wow, I, I've never painted in my life, it seems, because this is not working. <laughs> and that's that's what, you know, that's common because if you're uh, approaching different subjects and different light and different themes all the time, you, it's it's su- perfection and success every time is probably going to be elusive. And that's what keeps us after the the, the brass ring. got two takeaways and part of this is you know i i did explore your website and uh, i was fascinated by some of your blog posts and uh, one of the things that you mentioned or espouse is this idea of doing something in 40 strokes oh yeah yeah what's what's the value in doing that and what does what does that mean and what's the value in doing that well that is an exercise that sort of was going around there, there. A lot of people will call it a limited brushstroke exercise. And I, uh, I learned about it from my friend, Colin page. who's a fantastic artist. He, I actually took a little workshop with him and he had us do this exercise and we, we did it a different way than I, than I do it. But I told him, I said, I always give you credit when I do this because you, you know, you taught it to me and he said, Oh, I just ripped it off the internet. <laughs> and then he started mentioning other artists that do it. And yeah. all to say that I, for me, I looked at it and I thought my big thing, I mean, we can talk about color and value all day long, but my big thing is brushwork and the emotive quality that you can create in a painting by the amount of paint you use, the type of brush and where you lay that stroke. So, um, I, I watched people, I watched a lot of people that took workshops from me and they tend to, they're because of their unsuredness, they might start licking the canvas, which is a funny term I learned from my friend, Terry Miura, who's another fabulous artist. Look him up. <laughs> I had a funny image when you said, I'm thinking like, yeah, a, well, like a like, cat you know, licking its that, paws, that, that, you know, over and over and over. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's so funny because yeah. it's, it, if you watch someone taking their brush and dabbing the canvas without any direction, it looks like they're licking with a brush. So, um, I figured, well, how, how, you know, when I teach, I don't want to just say, here's what you need to do. I want to show you ways you can do it. So it helps to, to do that underpainting. I talked about the value underpainting. And then I have people premix a lot of color, which means you have piles to scoop and go. You don't have to spend time, you know, adulterating and getting mud all over your brush. You've got these separate piles you can work with. The trick is, is that people who have dabby strokes think 40 strokes, how am I going to do that? Well, this teaches you that one stroke can last for several seconds, if that makes sense, just talking about it and not showing it. So if you get enough paint on your brush and you have a big shape to fill in, you can get get the paint down. If you leave your, your brush on the canvas and you get that paint you know, up and down, cross, whatever stroke you need to do to get that space filled, that's a stroke. And so not only does it teach people to load more paint on their brush, but it also teaches them that they can put fill in simple shapes at first that I think that's a good learning curve for, for beginners and and people just starting out, because if you get too excited about brushwork too fast, you can end up with mud if you don't know what you're doing. And I, I bet a lot of people listening are going to say, Amen. (laughs) 
Amen. <laughs> well, I, I, I did. It's a restraint. It's, yeah. it's a discipline and it's not, I'm not touting it as the way to paint, but I started to notice after I taught the exercise for a while that that is actually sort of how I paint just sort of in the extreme is, is getting simple shapes in, getting a lot of paint on the brush. But having said that, I don't mean gob paint on, I mean, get shapes filled in and then figure out where the edges are hard or soft and it becomes intuitive after a while. But I think that that exercise teaches people to feel something different than they, they wouldn't ordinary feel, ordinarily feel. And then that might lead them to some excitement of, okay, wait a minute, I can be a painterly painter, you know? So yeah. it's just a start. I've never done it. I've never heard of it. So this There's is... There's many versions out there. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, I, I, I have a whole section on it on, on in my DVD called A Painter's Journey. And it's I've got probably four demonstrations throughout the whole thing. And it's 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 a DVD, but it's also available for download or streaming on Vimeo. It's all on my website, AnnBlairBrown.com. Yeah, we'll provide a link for that so you can find oh, and, it. And you also have, a, I think, a trailer that gives you a glimpse as to what that DVD is about. So you yeah, can get an impression that's on of what- on my homepage. And there's two little, actually there's a little clip of the 40 brush stroke just to get a taste of what you're, what you can see on the, on the video. But it's, it's, it's a one of four demonstrations. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that, that people tell me is that exercise has helped them open up. You have limited choices and limited strokes and you are forced, delightfully so, but you're forced to make these decisions and, and just do something a little different than, than the norm. So I get really good feedback about that. The, the 40 strokes reminds me of a limited palette, but like you said, it's limited brush strokes. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean necessarily you're being sloppy and slapdash. No. You're being thoughtful. You, uh- you're this you'll you'll be very tired when you finish one of these exercises. <laughs> the amount of, of thought that you have to put into it. And I I'll I'll say right there that I know that expressive painters and I was even reading like a Mark Chagall quote the other day, if I think I cannot create. Okay, that's great, but you have a million years of mileage under your belt and you no longer have to think. So when I'm teaching, my message is usually I want to get you to slow down so that you can speed up and just putting thought into what you want out of your art and, you know, pre-thinking the value structure a little bit, pre-thinking the color scheme a little bit. That's when, to me, the brushstroke becomes sort of the excitement part of it. And then you don't have to think after a while. So it's, you know, I've. I think a lot of thought, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, um, does it matter what brush you use, or or does that have a does that play in? You know, the, y- your yeah. Choices? You want to you want to use bigger brushes, and when I say bigger, I mean if I'm doing that exercise, I generally and say it's an eleven by fourteen canvas. I'll try to use like a number ten brush. And I'd always, that's one of my big things too, is to, to encourage people to use bigger brushes than they're comfortable with. You'd be so surprised that you could use a big fat gesso brush, two inch gesso brush on a painting. And if you turn it the right way, and if you have the right wrist movement, you can make a line. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. So they get stuck in these little bitty eyelash brushes. And I don't think that lends to expression. And that's just my opinion. And I, you know, I have seen people use little tiny brushes and do fabulous paintings. But when I'm teaching, I'm, I'm just saying, you know what, just, just go for it. You know, just feel something different. And the more uncomfortable you are, the more that you're sort of forced to figure some things out. And I think that's just incredible learning opportunity. Sometimes you, you, you discover new things by using something that feels Absolutely. uncomfortable at first. Absolutely. And, and we don't like the word uncomfortable, but it's, it's, it's been a big part of my painting and you know, I, 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 I walk the walk. I try to anyway, and I take workshops that, that make me do different things. And I, I do what the instructor says and it's out of my comfort zone and I'm always better off for it always. So that's, I think it's important to not be too comfortable all the time. Yeah. We have the, the limited brush strokes, but you also, I mean, your paintings are just, they, they feel like they're full of color. But yet you use a limited palette. 
Right. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that, that's another, um, if you limit yourself, you know, you're, you're encouraged and forced to come up with different things. So what I do is I use a warm and cool of the primaries. And then I have some earth tones that I use as tools. So it's, and then I have phthalo green and I can, I can switch it for viridian or, or things like that. That's an intense color. It's very intense. And if, if you're not skilled with it, it can, you're very your, brave. Yes. It can ruin your life. <laughs> and it did for a while, but see, like I said, I use it as a tool, my palette currently, and this, this can change on a dime or I can, I can switch things out and work with it. But generally I've got phthalo green. I've been playing a lot with Prussian blue. I've got ultramarine permanent rose, which can, I can use quinacridone. I can use all kinds of different stuff, but I like this permanent rose. Cad red light, burnt sienna, a lemon or a light yellow, it really doesn't matter, a um, Indian yellow, which I use a transparent Indian yellow, which is kind of important to my palette, but I could use a, a different sort of yellow if I had to. It's a beautiful color, yeah. It is. And um, then, uh, let's see, yellow ochre and white. And so you see there's warm and cool primaries, and that's that's the key, that's something I think I learned from Don Whitelaw that to me is the springboard. And then when I really want to shift something, I might stick a little phthalo green in a sky blue mixture, little bitty, bitty bit, and it pumps up the blue. So it's little formulas, you know, it's if you're cooking, you're not going to dump a whole thing of salt in your soup. You're going to put a little fleck in and taste it. So that's how I use some of these stronger colors or the earth tones to, to bend my color. As for the the core of your question, there's limited palette. How do you get all that color? It's actually, it becomes intuitive, but I follow the color wheel a lot, not as a formula, but as a, you know, if I'm, whether I'm working from photo reference or I'm outside, I pick sort of a key color and then I think, okay, what harmony can I create with this? I don't really have to copy that grass. I don't really have to copy that, what a chair I'm looking at. I want this painting to look crafted and harmonious. So I use, I always have that in my back pocket when I'm, when I'm painting that just, you know, if I set up a still life, I don't have to match the blue of that vase or the purple of that cup. Well, what I do is I just create something from the color wheel where it can be my painting, even if I'm looking at nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, it yeah. reminds me of a music scale. You, you, a musician learns multiple scales and and you're shifting uh, in one direction or or the other to get a a, a musical tonal difference. Not that I'm right. a musician; I know absolutely no. That's about brilliant. Me, that's that, exactly what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, no, that's that's you can always compare the arts that way. But yeah, it's it's and it makes painting more fun than trying to mimic everything you see. And and again, I to be honest, it became so intuitive. I've actually just recently gotten in my color wheel back out and kind of revisited the different harmonies because I'm, I'm getting ready to teach a interior um, painting workshop in February. And I wanted to really focus on how to translate a photo using the photo only as a suggestion and creating your own color harmony, putting your own, you know, personal brushwork into it and making it your painting. That's interesting because photos or something I have to to use to some degree, but I don't, I don't want to um, you know, necessarily copy them. But they're a memory aid to me, and right, yeah. But there's there's pitfalls. I understand there are, and I'm I'm aiming to to teach you know how to avoid those pitfalls. I think if if you're a true artist or you're you're aspiring to a certain path. It is, it's wise to know how to handle different ways of painting, whether it be from life or be from photo reference, and know how to make all those paintings look the same, have the same energy. And I think, I think it's a thing. I mean, I think a lot of people, you might hear some people, oh, I never paint from photo reference, and I don't believe it. <laughs> you know? and, and then, you, you know, you look at my start, and I was painting restaurants and waiters and things like that. Well, they don't stay still, you know. No. And, so I figured out through brushwork how to make it look like they're moving, working from photo reference. But the the fundamental notion behind that was that I spent years, years, years in school and in life painting the figure from life 
when I was at Watkins College, I I think I did a whole semester of I think three days a week, six hours a day gesture. You know, just and it. I mean, it was exhausting. And what, that was just what do, one. What do you mean one, by gesture? You, just you, the, the, you get a model, and the instructor says, "Okay, thirty second poses." So thirty oh, okay. second poses for however long. Okay, a minute pose, and do minute pose, for, and you're just drawing, 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 and then drawing some more. I think a lot of people have missed that sort of boot camp, if, especially if they didn't go to college for art. But I have, you know, that started when I was 18 years old. And I'm, I can't lie to you. I'm not saying I did that from then to now every day. But that, that basis and then learning to paint outside, painting from life as much as I can, that translates. And that you can't, it's like riding a bicycle. That doesn't go away. So through looking at the color wheel and looking at different ways to apply paint and looking at ways to connect to your art, I think you can very successfully use photo reference if you just don't be a slave to it. What are some of the pitfalls? Oh, well, for one thing, cameras one eye and we have two. Often, and um, when I t- talk about photographs, let's let's take off the table professional photography. Let's just, you know, us right. with our iPhones. Yeah, our little snapshots from us our with iPhones. Our, yeah. <laughs> well, our, yeah, or our iPhones. The darks can be too dark. The lights can be too light. The whole thing can be washed out. The color can be completely off. Um, You know, for me, even if you can't paint from life, if you're on a painting trip, if you take a photo and even do like a pencil sketch, that's more of a connection to the scene than than just snapping a photo. But they're they're just a basic basically a lie. And when I'm painting from photos, I don't put them in Photoshop and make them perfect or color correct them. I try to draw from my experience and my sense memory, what, what I, what drew me to the scene. And I, again, through using the, the crafts of color wheel and brushwork and value range, I create my own painting from that. And it's enjoyable. I mean, it's hard to, I paint outside a lot, but then I sitting in my studio with my little glass of tea and <laughs> it's really comfortable. It, you know, it's okay to be comfortable sometimes. But I always I always sit down and draw from the photo and just reconnect to it. And sometimes I come up with a different composition than I photographed. I, I think it's all valid as long as you're doing it from the heart and you have the experience to make it look lifelike. So your paintings seem to have a feel of thoughtfulness. We've talked a little bit about that, but I, I have to think that there is a process that you go through before you even lay the first wash on your canvas. Oh yeah. What is that? Well, it, it, I've, I've touched on it, but I lay it out in steps and, you know, this is again, all, um, in my latest DVD, which is a really good catalog of, of a process that, you know, I I will morph the process as I grow, but it's a really good springboard, especially for those who don't really have any direction in their work yet. So basically what I do is if I'm, let's say I'm outside and I'm looking at this huge, you know, scene and there's so much information. What I do is I tend to do little contour drawings first and I don't think about color. I don't think about value. Even I think about what's a contour drawing. You mean just contour drawing is you just outline. And this is the, one of the only times you'll see me only draw lines. Ah. And it's, it's something I learned in college and, so envision a tree with no leaves and all you see is sticks. Well, I see a lollipop. So the contour would be just the out, the outlay of all those branches and a stick, you know, to, to be very, very simple. So I just do that. And what, why I do it that way is when you do that a lot, you start looking and you say, well, all I see is shapes. I don't see twigs. I, I can't put in eyelashes. I can't put in... You know, you see the dog and not the fleas. So are, are, that's you, saying, like, are you saying that you, you put the pencil to paper and it is kind of like your 40 brush strokes? Yeah. You, yeah. Exactly. You, you keep drawing, you keep extending that one line. Is that what you mean? Exactly. So I, I don't really take the pencil off and that helps me not shade and do all that stuff that is important. And a lot of people do thumbnails with shading and that's all they do. And they're and they're brilliant. But in my growth as an artist and growth as a teacher, I'm thinking, how do I get people to see basic shapes? 
So that's that's the way I do it. And that's the way that's become more effective for me to take a macrocosm and try to get it on a little bitty canvas. So that's the first thing I do. And then I might even redraw, you know, a contour drawing I like and then shade it or do a no tan. And the no tan is the the term is basically a Japanese term and it's the balance of dark and light. And if you think of the yin and yang symbol, right, it's really literally scaling everything down to black or white, dark or light. And so that for me has been probably the biggest thing that has simplified my work and made it more sophisticated. And a little secret, I really haven't put this in a DVD yet. I talked about no tan in my DVD. You heard it first here on this podcast. (laughs) Andy tip, hot off the press. No, but I've actually started, I started playing around with acrylics and acrylics, since they dry so fast and they can be tacky, I, my process of doing a a four value wash doesn't work. So what I started doing was just doing a no tan with acrylics and, you know, imagine you're looking at a scene and there's a light hitting a vase. And so there's dark and there's light. Now in life, there's a middle tone and all kinds of goodies, but in no tan, you have to eliminate that and choose, you know, is it going to go into dark or is it going to go into light? So just looking at that gives you the absolute, bottom bones foundation of a painting. And that's, that's good stuff. And you're doing that in a sketchbook, right? I do it. I I draw them out a lot when I'm, when I'm really walking the walk, I always do a no tan, but what I'm doing in the studio when I'm working with acrylics or, or actually even oil just for fun, I might even wash in just the dark and light of the scene. More than half the people in every workshop I have have never heard the term no tan, but it's also the singularly most important foundational element I can imagine. So it's it's very interesting. I talk about it a lot to try to get it out there. A lot of artists I've actually noticed now that I know the term and I've studied it for several years. Um, there's many artists out there who always do a no tan drawing before they paint. Um, David Boyd's one of them. I've noticed he did that. Jill Carver does that too. She's a big advocate. advocate yeah, for that. I mean, look at her work. You know, yeah. but if if you're listening and you don't know what it is, look it up. And there's a um, there's a gentleman named Mitch Albala. I've never met him, but he had some articles in the magazine is escaping me. But there's a lot of Internet um, information out there. And he in particular has some really choice things to say about it. He got me to understand it and just reading his literature. Yeah, he's got a great book. As yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm no expert on it. I'm a student of it, but I can tell you it is it's something to to sink your teeth into. Well, that's the fun of our craft. We're always students, right? Exactly. Keeps yeah. you young. I like it. You have something it, to learn tomorrow. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning as I'm listening. To, I've already, I've, I've made a big list of, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't say big list, but uh, I just read a book about the uh, 19th century uh, uh, development of the Transcontinental Railroad. And, and the, the author, uh, Stephen Ambrose, was saying that uh, in the 19th century, they loved hyperbole. And so I find myself doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got a big list. No, there's three items on it. That's not a big list. But it, 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 if it's if it's <laughs> what we're talking about, it's pretty big stuff, though. It, it's the but it's a, painting. It, exactly. See, I've never done the forty stroke thing. I have heard about the no tan, but I have to admit, I really have not applied what I've heard on that. So that's one of the things I want to do. And then spend more time with this idea of using a limited palette, but shifting it in, you know, the the story that I want to tell for a particular painting. And I want to give a little more thought to the design process before my brush actually hits the canvas. Excellent. That's your answer is is no tan. I mean, I, I sat with a bunch of friends one day and we this was probably 10 years ago, and I hadn't heard of the term yet. And we all were looking at each other like, I went to three college art colleges. Why have I never heard this term? But what it does is it gives you the soul of your painting. And that- Whoa, whoa, whoa. Say that, say that again. It, it shows you the soul of your painting before you paint it. That is the most elegant, beautiful expression I've ever heard. For that, <laughs> that that is that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! 
I like no, that. It's true. It's true. It, 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 um, the, we think, we think we see an object and we draw it and we've done our painting and we're done, but there's so much more to it. And that, that might be a lofty goal for some. And I understand that, but for me, it's a, again, a lifelong pursuit on, on how to, how to connect with my art so that I can connect with the viewer. And I think that's why I'm doing this whole thing, frankly. And you, you know something else you do? You've been doing it for the last uh, almost an hour, and that's teaching. Yeah. That, that, it just it seems comes to naturally. Come, yeah, that's what I was going to That's exactly what was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> it <laughs> seems so natural to you. And uh, I just, I, there's something about teaching that helps reinforce the ideas. Yeah, what? I think so. Well, what? I'm paying it forward, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I had a hunger and a need to learn how to do this. And I learned from people. And, you know, even when I'm taking a workshop from someone who's not particularly good at, quote unquote, teaching, just watching people do their craft well is is a lesson in and of itself. And it's funny because if you had told me I would be a teacher officially um, about, I don't know, 20 years ago, I would have said, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Because I just, I didn't have the confidence to do it. But then eventually I started to learn a couple of things and it just, my first thought was, well, I know what it's like to not know this. And now that I know it, I want to help people know it. And so that just morphed into um, sort of a a constant teaching mode, to be honest with you. And um, some people might call it bossy. Ha ha ha. Why, um, why would they call it bossy? I don't, I don't. You know, I, well, you, I don't usually, you're interviewing me and asking me questions about art. So I feel like I, I want to illuminate my process. Therefore I'm teaching, but there are unsolicited moments where one must not, you know, look at any, like I can't look at somebody's random art and just say, Hey, right there, you should have done this. Like I never do that. You know, I, I don't do but, that. But you see now, now you just described something that I think is an important quality of a teacher. There's a time to hold back. You know, we can have our heads full of knowledge, but sometimes we have to hold back. <laughs> yes. And, and then, then when it is solicited, uh, you're able to to share because the student is now more receptive uh, to that. But as, yes. but on the flip side, I think we as a student need to be humble enough that whatever comes down the pike, uh, you know, be humble and 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 learn and and learn from it. Right, I, I agree with you totally, and I think you know I've, I can in one workshop full of maybe 16 people, you know, I might have someone that thought, okay, I'm going to take this workshop. I love her work, whatever. And they don't have the foundational skills to, to get near where they think they want to be at that point. And that's okay. So I don't, I try not to overwhelm people like that. And what I do at, at that point, if I see that they're struggling with even drawing something correctly, and when I say correctly, I mean, you have to make it believable. You don't have to do it perfectly. Right. But yeah. My job at that point is to encourage, I think, and not to say, well, you just don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I wouldn't, let you know, so it's you, I, I tend to f- try to focus on each people's, each person's level and then encourage them within that. And then maybe give them one or two things to reach for. Cause it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, if, if, you know, I have a lot of mileage, but I'm not near where I want to be, not near. So I understand if, if you don't have this skill or you don't understand A, B, or C. But it's it's a delight. It's a delight to see people's passion for it. And if I had a dollar for everybody who said, oh, well, my, my mom told me I wasn't any good, so I really hadn't done it. Now I'm 65 and here I am. Or my dad said I had to make a living, so I've been an architect and I, I hated it. But here I am trying to loosen up. And the majority of my students are like that. And... So I've sort of set a goal to be the one to say, you can do this. You know, it's not too late and you don't have to be perfect. It's, it's going to just be fun.
I got into this mode of not taking a whole lot of workshops this year. Yeah. Because I got over, I got the overwhelm last year when I was doing it. And I, and I, and I was head, I, I, I did go into it realizing I was in over my head. I didn't have some of the fundamentals that I really should have had going into the, to the workshop. So I thought, okay, I got, I got to back up here and just yeah, try. With a good instructor though, that's okay. You know, yeah. with someone willing to, to talk to you on your level. Well, no one ever made me feel bad. Let me just clarify. Good. I don't want, because if, if they're listening to this, I don't want them to feel like, uh, you know, they put pressure on me. They did not. They were, they were all, all to a T. I mean, they were very what? kind and encouraging to me. So very good. There. Well, one of the things about um, that I that I wanted to do differently um, with with the, a painter's journey is, you know, I, I've bought DVDs before, and again, it's available for streaming or download. So it's you, if you don't have a DVD player, which is common these days, you can get it that way. But um, I, I watch DVDs that, quite frankly, gave me some fanny fatigue. LOL. <laughs> and, <laughs> what do you? Wait a minute. What do you mean by that? The, the instructors just. Actually, like I said, I learned from everything I, I watch. Or oh, yeah, yeah. But, but I wanted to do something different where it was a little bit interactive, where you could, it's in chapters and you, it's like you're taking a workshop and I'm, it's like I'm talking to you. Um, I had a wonderful um, friend who's a very high end um, videographer here in Nashville and he asked me questions. And so what's happening is it's an, it's a dynamic um, interplay between me and what, what seems to be my student and, and I share my process and it's, like I said, there were, there's four demos. So it's in different chapters. You can completely stop. You can paint along. <clears throat> um, so I, I wanted to do something different where you just didn't sit and stare at one painting for two and a half hours. So for the, for, you know, if, if you're, like you, I, I mention it not to shamelessly plug myself again. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, that's okay. I want you to oh, because no, but, it, I have noticed this through just watching the the trailers. I I've produced videos too for many years, so there was a quality to this that uh, I was impressed with. I I don't mind you thank sharing. You, and this. I have to yeah. give credit to to Creative Communications. This is the company and Creative Communications. Okay, yeah, my friend Matt Perkle. They, I, I can't believe. Now, granted, I've known this man since I was a child, and that was sort of a, an ace in the hole for me. But he—he's not a, a painter. He's a, he was an actor, and now he's a videographer. But he—he he knew what to ask me. He could listen to four things I said, and he knew exactly how to guide me to talk to what would be a student. And so, um, again, the reason I mention it is, you said, "Well, I was in a workshop, and I, I didn't quite have the fundamentals." This. My what I'm sharing can sort of give give you a springboard if you're not sure. And I'm not talking to you specifically, but you can, you know, it applies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> hey, but, OK. But, you know. All right, class, gather around. <laughs> Anne's going to tell us something important. Well, here. So I'll, I'll give you an analogy. I've been working with a personal trainer for a year because I, as I age, I want my core to be strong. So yeah. She, the trainer who's 34 and just adorable and perfectly fit, she's been doing uh, this handstand thing. So she does these handstand classes and this is her goal is to be able to do a free handstand for 10 minutes. You know, it's, that's her body goal. So I thought, you know, that would be fun. And so I was there yesterday and she said, well, do you want to try one? And I recall being young and being able to just flip over and get my feet against the wall and do a handstand that way. So I began to try it and I thought, Oh my God, <laughs> I, am, I am acting the fool. I cannot do this. And I looked at her, I said, you know, can I practice this at home before we try this? And so that's kind of like what I'm saying about having a, a DVD that's like a workshop or a little, you know, you can sort of do it in your privacy, your home. And then you might feel like, all right, I, if I do this process that I can even apply, you can even take it and put it into your own process. You don't have to copy what I do. But if you have no idea what you're doing, it might be fun to do that. And I think that's a, a good teaching tool that, that I learned growing up is, uh, you know, mimicking is a form of learning. So it, you can do it that way or you can take snippets and put it into your own repertoire. But then I'm talking about a lot of fundamentals that are not, you know, a lot of people don't have under their belt for various reasons. And it can just give you a leg up. And you can do it in the privacy of your own home. So I'm real excited about that aspect of it. Yeah, I, th I think that's great. You know, and, and 
and, and the idea of mimicry is it's a very powerful way to learn. It's it's a way that I learn. I like to watch somebody do it, and then I can then I can go off and and do it myself yeah. and, and and practice and and not have the pressure of of my ego condemning me. You know, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's you know workshops can. I mean, I I again I take them all the time because I want to get better as an artist and and I also want to learn different ways of teaching and see what other people are up to. And then I also want to remember what it's like to stand in, in a room, sometimes cramped, sometimes not with my personal space that I like and work, do something completely out of left field that I've never done before and feel like a complete idiot <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in that position. I can think of a specific instance when I just, I, you know, I was out painting with a very famous painter and i turned for one second and my whole easel and all my turp went flying down and, you know, just absolute mess. And I'm a professional artist at this point. And I'm thinking, Oh no, I'm that person. I, <laughs> I'm nervous. And I, and I spilled everything and it's, you did you know. a Jackson Pollock plein air. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but, but it's, it can be uncomfortable, but again, that's, that's a good thing. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess we, all to some degree or another must struggle with that. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. but to be a good student, I mean, the, what, what are some of the things that you have observed uh, that we probably shouldn't do as a student that could save us some time or, or improve our experience in a workshop setting? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, okay. I, I you know, without calling out, no, anything. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do feel okay. I know. Okay, we're all you were. We're all vulnerable people, and we don't want to yeah, be vulnerable yeah. all the time. One of the things I've noticed is kind of explaining away, and um, it 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 would help you to to enter a a learning environment completely open to the fact that you're you're not a bad person if you make a mistake, meaning. A lot of people will say to me, I'll say, okay, well here, this is working, but this, I know I do it all the time. That's my thing. I just can't do, you know, and I'm, and I'm right. like, well, let's stop doing that. You know, let's, you know, let's focus on what's good and see if the battle fade away. But, but, you know, just being able to disown a, a bad habit is, is a good thing. Um, and disown not focus- a bad habit. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, I mean, I, I can tell you what my bad habits are, not even in painting and I was, Oh, I'm just like this. And I, and then I think, well, stop being like that. Okay. Well, how do you do that? Well, I have to change my mindset, you know, and that, I think that'll help. There's a lot of self deprecation that way. That's, it's not conducive to fun painting, but that's just, you know, that's just one thing. And, and just being open and open to new things and, I've had so many people when I say, okay, I need you to use this big fat number 12 brush and they've never used anything over a two. And then I come over and they're using their two. And I, and I, I used to, I used to not know what to say. And now I say, you know what, you have paid to be here and you are welcome to do anything you want to do. And, um, if you are, if you are feeling uncomfortable, I don't want you to, you know, I don't want, and most people go, Oh, you're right. But if I came over and said, what are you doing? Take that, you know, that, yeah, that's, not, yeah, yeah. that's not nice. <laughs> I wouldn't want that either. <laughs> no, I'd not. probably deserve it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand the basis of it. I, I understand, um, especially when I'm teaching people who have a background in drawing, whether they're an architect, an illustrator, it is not easy to shift gears at all. And as a matter of fact, it's more than uncomfortable. It's painful. So I understand that, you know, and I want to work with people I want to encourage people to get out of their comfort zone, but I don't want them to be horribly uncomfortable. When I take workshops, there's, there's a, there's a time when an instructor might come up and you haven't gotten to the place where you're doing what they're teaching. And then they come and correct you and people's, what they want to do is argue. And I've learned, even if I know that I'm going to do what he said or she said, and I haven't done it yet. And then they're correcting me. I'll just say, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't want to explain away. Oh, I know I was going to do that, but and the, you know, I I don't want my ego involved when I'm trying to learn something. So that's that's something I work on is just say thank you or okay, 
Got it. I think that's good advice because I think I think all of us, to some extent, we are we can be defensive, and so we want to explain ourselves yeah. away. And right, yeah. So that's that's a good lesson. Well, that was a good that. question because you know being an open student is important if you want to grow. And I, I try to do that, and I know what it feels like when your ego is bruised a little bit. Yeah. I've been in a, a couple of classes where uh, there was a domineering individual and it, it made the, to me, it made the experience not pleasant because they were challenging the instructor. <clears throat> well, that's, that's a good point because one of the things that I try to do when I start a workshop is I know there's a bunch of different personalities and, a, and people are nervous and, what I try to do is set an environment where everybody feels safe on the same level because I know that that can happen. And I know that people paid to come and they don't want to deal with other people's personalities because they're, you know, it's again, it's, it can be nerve wracking. So I always just tell people, you know, this is your journey where, you know, I'll do my best to work with you one-on-one -on -one. You know, person next to you might paint every day and you haven't painted in three years and you're going to be like, oh, no, I, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's your journey and your time. And if you don't have, you know, if you have a job or a bunch of kids and you can't paint every day and yeah, you're not where you want to be, we'll just work with it. Don't beat yourself up, you know, and, yeah. and I just try to deflate the no, you know, I try to let everybody know they're going to come away with what they need for their individual purposes. And I generally I say that because I generally don't have a lot of um, there's definitely big personalities. I think many artists are hilarious and especially in the South. It's I don't know if you've <laughs> noticed, but Southern people are funny. <laughs> They're just gregarious. Funny. <laughs> yeah, it's just so funny and fun. And usually I find that, that the big personalities are actually entertaining. You know, yeah. and hopefully I've set a tone where there nobody feels like challenging me out loud. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, not yet. Yeah, do, all right, y'all don't mess with Ann now. <laughs> I do. My dad's from Queens, New York. I've, I've got a little bit of that in me. So right. <laughs> you folks that do these workshops, you are a special bunch, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's definitely it definitely takes a lot of energy, but. It's currently my best way to, to share what I want to share. And apparently some people want to hear it. And that makes me very happy and very yeah. grateful. Yeah. Are you teaching workshops throughout the South or across the United States? Where, where, you know, where are I, you going? Well, I've, I've, um, I've done a lot of traveling workshops. And I've found that um, I actually, my mother, who is a highly organized person and has run several businesses. She, she runs my workshops here in Nashville, meaning she's the back of the house. Nice. And so, and she's also a very lovely person, wonderful, caring personality. Um, she provides, you know, she makes sure we have delicious lunches and that kind of thing. So I found that doing workshops here in Nashville has been a really good model for me in terms of the, you know, the, having my own way of doing things and knowing how things are going to play out and therefore providing a very good experience for the student. Having said that, I do go places that I get asked to teach a lot out of town and I can't do that because I, I would be traveling all the time, but I'm doing one in April in new harmony, which is a really good venue. And they have this thing called for first of, spring or something like that. And where are they um, located? They're in, in New Harmony, Indiana. Okay. I'd never heard of it. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's, a, it's an area, it's another area chock full of good, good art vibe. Mm. And so I'll be teaching up there end of April. And then I teach in Charleston usually once a year, sometimes twice because I'm in a gallery there, Meyer Vogel Gallery. And these lovely ladies, also fabulous artists themselves, um, and they invite me to come and, and we always fill up the workshop and just have an absolute blast. And other than that, I've, I've recently acquired, um, Trey Finney and I have both acquired a farmhouse in Santa Fe, Tennessee, which is about 40 minutes from my house in Nashville. Is it, but it's, is it east, west, south, north? It's uh, southwest. 
And it's okay. about minutes from the historic, cute little town of Leaper's Fork. And it's, yeah, it's near Franklin, yeah. Tennessee, which most people would know. Anyway, that's it's been a, a workshop venue for us where we can do a nice contained plein air class. We have renovated a barn so we can, you know, conduct classes in there and in inclement weather. And the house on the property was built in 1880, and we spent most of the last year renovating that and the barn. And it is a delightful venue. Yeah, I bet that's going to be amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I'll have to come up and see that. Oh, you must. And then you can see art in person. That would um, be great. Yeah. So, and I'm in a, Trey and I are both in the gallery in Leapers Creek called, Le, or Leapers Fork called Leapers Creek Gallery. So that's, it's just our second home, that whole area. So yeah. um, that's, that's one of the reasons that I'm sticking close to home when I'm teaching is I've, I've really invested in this wonderful venue and the students that we've taught there so far have just loved every second and every inch of it. So it's, it's a good thing. Can we talk a, a little bit about business? Would, sure. would you be comfortable with that? Okay. Sure. So you've mentioned uh, being in a number of galleries and I, I'm, I'm curious about, I've never been in a gallery, so <laughs> I'm curious yeah. about that process. How do you know when you're ready for something like that? And, and, and what are some life lessons that you've learned and uh, that would help us reach the goal of perhaps being in a gallery or selling our art in, in some other venue? That's a good question. It's um, a loaded question. It is a loaded question. Well, and it's funny because I want to make money. <laughs> don't we all? Well, yeah. you know, I feel like there's, you know, I operate on a very personal level. And so I, I, I'm not one to, to give you the high end business. Here's how you do it. Because I tend to work with karma, <laughs> you know. So what happened to me was being at the right place at the right time and doing some local shows around Nashville and the internet just just coming around at that point and having knowing my work is on the internet and having galleries see me before I had to go to them. And I think the other kind of right place, right time thing for me was I was painting a theme, as I mentioned, and not a lot of people were doing interiors. And so whether my work was great at that point or not, I think a lot of a lot of galleries saw, oh, there's a niche that, that I can add into my repertoire here. And so my message business-wise is if you can find something that that separates you and that sets you apart, that's a big thing because there's a lot of artists out there. And even if you're a landscape painter and there's a million, million of them, how are you going to do it differently? How, how right. are we going to connect with you? So that's a big part of it. The other thing I would say is be consistent. I'm guilty of not being consistent sometimes because life pulls me away and I might owe galleries work and I don't have it, but they, they tend to want to have you hanging and have at least six solid paintings. And that's just a random number, but. Now, did they approach you or did you approach them? How did most that work? of the galleries I'm in approached me and I'm very grateful to say that. Um, How did they find you? Um, well, let's see. The current ones, one, I'm in a gallery called Semi Merrillis Gallery in Provincetown, um, Massachusetts. And she found me on the internet and she emailed me. This was years and years ago. And I was really just starting out. And I was doing the restaurant scenes and waiters and stuff like that. And she sent me this beautiful letter and said I would, I would be very well represented there. And I remember thinking, I don't even know where that is. And I was not a good business person. And I said, thank you, but no. And so then I received a second email that was the most eloquent letter I've ever received. And I knew I had to, to be with these people. Oh, wow. Sent her work and people were buying it off the floor. <laughs> 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 that was before the first uh, financial collapse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but having said that, that's that was an anomaly, and that was we, I'm still in her gallery. I adore her. We we work so well together, and that was just one of those gifts from God, I think. And she's pro I've probably been with her the longest. And then the gallery I mentioned in Leapers Fort, Leapers Creek Gallery, that's owned by Lisa Fox, and probably the prettiest gallery I've been in. She's and she's probably the nicest person I know, and just a natural fit with my being in the area. And um, a lot of the aforementioned artists that I said were rock stars here in Nashville, 
and they live out that way too. Um, we're all in that gallery. So that's, it's like a family that that's kind of, you know, I fell into a bowl of cream with a lot of this and <clears throat> the one I mentioned in Charleston, Meyer Vogel, it's these ladies are uh, Marissa Vogel and Laurie Meyer, and they're just fantastic artists. And we just gelled personally too. And they just found my work. I think at this point it was just more, we knew similar people and they invited me to be in. And I just think without being too goofy, <laughs> there's just a karma aspect to it. Just uh, like think, minds, you yeah, know, like I, I could see that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, I mean, if you're, if you paint, you know, ladies in skirts, probably don't go to Jackson hole and say, will you show my work? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. If, if you paint cowboys, go to Jackson hole and say, Hey, are you interested? Um, you know, maybe find like-minded people. And that's not to say that, a gallery doesn't want something different than the other artists on their walls, but you know, know your audience, I guess too. And know your gallery. And know your gallery. Yeah. And I've, I've left a couple out, but generally it's been just sort of a meeting of the minds more than a knocking on the door. It's been, I've been very grateful for it too. And be careful what you wish for. Why is you that? Know, you do don't want to be, a, well, it's if you're in galleries and my galleries all are particularly open and understand the artists needing to grow. And so if I change something or use a different medium, that's okay. But sometimes that's not okay to some people. So if you are somebody who wants to grow exponentially every day and you show a gallery, 12 beautiful still lives painted in oil and they love you. And then the next month you painted, you know, clowns right. with, with gouache <laughs> and they're like, well, that's not exactly what we, you know, so just know that you might, you might, the consistency of, of your product for lack of a better term can sometimes be an issue. So if you choose your galleries wisely, then that usually won't happen. So what is the responsibility of the artist and what is the responsibility of the galleries? Generally you, it's usually a 50, 50 split. I am in one gallery in Kennebunkport that is 60, 40, and I'm very grateful for that. Usually the artist is responsible for shipping the work if they're out of town, responsible for framing. You know, a consignment agreement is uh, is often sent out, but I don't have any contracts. I've never been asked to sign one and I've never given one. So generally people are really honest, but, you know, watch out for yourself. If the work doesn't sell, the, the gallery is usually responsible for shipping it back. Usually, you know, you should get paid within a month if you don't then that could be an issue. All my galleries usually pay right away. Can't think of anything else major. I, I'm, I'm really curious about the sales cycle. I mean, how long does it take typically to sell? I'm trying to wrap my mind around the, the sales cycle. Uh, is, are we talking months, years, or it what's reasonable? It depends on the artist. Yeah. It depends on the artist. If um, I'll just speak to myself because that's all I know to, to speak to. Um, there are one or two galleries that might call me if something's been there two months and say, you know what, I think this, you might put this somewhere else now. And it's all, it's all good and well, and no one's feelings are hurt. And very often I get back a painting and then I put it somewhere else and it sells the next day. It's so weird. I have in a couple of galleries that the, the one in Provincetown, I don't, I rarely get things shipped back because she just feels like the right home will come eventually. So I could sell something within a month of sending it or a two years could pass. And it just depends on your relationship with the gallery and how, how that relationship works. A lot of people are very product oriented and they might be more apt to say, send new work, we're sending this back. And that's common. That's not, it doesn't mean your work's bad if it comes back. If, if someone is in Leapers Fork, Tennessee and they're on vacation and they're in this cute Southern town, historic architecture, and th they might be a certain type of client. You know, they might have a certain thing they want. Now, generally, having said that, this particular gallery, we have a lot of country music stars that come in. We have a lot of famous people. It's, it's a hodgepodge of wonder. We love it. But then, you like, if you go to Provincetown, at the time I got popular up there, there are world travelers usually that, that either have places there or, or visit there in the summer. And... My my being at the right place at the right time, a lot of world travelers are, are diners and foodies. And there's all my restaurant paintings and bam, you know, 
we, yeah. meeting of the minds in terms of subject matter. So it, it's, it really depends. It depends on the clientele. It depends on the artist. Um, I, so another artist might have a more definitive answer, but for me, it's very random. And, you know, the only other thing I'll say is sometimes I'll call someone and say, Hey, you know what? This one's been there for a year. I, it just, I think it just needs new air and they'll be like, sure. And I'll give them something new. You just kind of have to use your noggin. How, how important is the framing? Of, uh, do, how much thought? <laughs> Let me try that again, Carl. You're <laughs> running out of steam here. <laughs> but I am curious. I'm curious about framing the painting because it, it's, it. I've heard some say the frames sell the paintings. I, I think that's probably a bit of oh, that hurts too. My feelings. <laughs> I know. I, that's what I was. <laughs> but I understand what they're saying. They say, you know, it's a package deal. You know, the frame complements the painting yeah. is what they really mean by that. Right. That would, that would hurt my fa- feelings if they were just <laughs> buy, buying the frame. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, think of a, a woman when she wakes up in the morning and she yeah. doesn't have any makeup. And she, if she's a beautiful woman, she's a beautiful woman. And then she might put on red lipstick and eyeliner and maybe look a little better, you know, but it, it, the, the package is the package. And there are trends there, you know, this is a, a two part question for me. If you don't like my painting, I don't, I mean, it's, that's not your taste, but the frame for me, I never get my feelings hurt. If someone says, well, I don't like the frame, like, I didn't make it. So take it, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> but there are trends right now. When I started in the very early two thousands, people in my area liked ornate, and then that went out quickly. And then people like dark frames and everybody's using a dark frame, people getting away from gold. Things t- are getting a little more contemporary all the way around right now. And so floaters are in. And, you know, I feel like if it, if the paint, if you look at my a framed piece of my work and you love the painting and you don't even see the frame, that's a good thing. I don't ever match frames in my house. I know what my taste is and, you know, some right. things large and gaudy. I I don't want it, but I I would say simple is best. And, you know, if you're in a gallery and they request a certain thing, I would trust them that their clientele knows what they want, but framing and shipping and stuff like that is sort of the bane of my existence because it's so expensive and you never know anybody's taste. So I have streamlined mine and I have very simple gold, very simple kind of silver gold and even a couple of dark. And I am using some floaters and I just decide there's certain galleries that I feel like they would want a more traditional frame on it. So I do that. But they, they would communicate that to you or you'd be able to discern that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I have I have one gallery I'm in in, in South Carolina, the, another one that I think they, they, I mean, they haven't asked me for contemporary, but they are, they sell a lot of um, high end work and do auctions and stuff. So it seems like they might be more into, into traditional, but they might also have noticed a trend. I don't know. I haven't spoken with them about it yet. If a gallery has a preference, I would go with it unless it, it goes against what you feel like looks good on your art. Um, but again, for me, simplicity is key. And the, the client will say, you know what, that frame doesn't work. And the gallery will always say, we'll give it to you unframed or we'll help you find a new one. It's usually not a huge deal. I, I've noticed a trend with a lot of uh, uh, gallery edge type stretch canvas where people yeah. are, you know, they don't even have a frame. It's just the, the deep gallery edge. Yeah, I think that's a nice look. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm working on a show for a gallery in um, Naples, uh, Gardner Colby, wonderful gallery. And they, they are on the side of contemporary. They're in Florida. So I'm actually doing some larger paintings that I'm, I've got on gallery wrap. I may put a thin floater on it, but I may not. And I, I think that's a very lovely look, especially in very simply decorated homes. It's it's my favorite look. I, I'm, yeah. I'm very partial to that myself. So, But I yeah. don't know. I have weird taste. So I, I don't know if, if, if I'm in line with what the majority of people right. like. But I, I like that look. Right. Well, therein lies why framing is so subjective. Yes. You know, just I mean, like I'll art itself, by, but I, I won't stand by my frames. I'll do whatever you want for a frame. You yeah, know? that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing your your insight on that, though, because I was just I, I haven't really had a really good in-depth discussion about about galleries and, and framing and, and things like yeah. that. So it's my pleasure. 
Yeah. Just opinions, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, artists are an opinionated bunch, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, one thing you'll never hear me say is, here's how to paint. I don't say that. I say, hey, I've developed this way of doing it. This, it's making it a little easier and more fun for me. Let's try it. Oh, <laughs> and then let's see what we can do next. Oh, that's you neat. Know? I like that. Yeah. That's, a nice, that's a nice philosophy. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. Then, then, then everybody that's painting, you don't become like the person that you're learning from. I mean, I see paintings. I, uh, I look at your paintings. Um, well, every guest I've had on the show, I said, oh, that's nice. I'd like to be able to do something like that, but I don't want to copy that. I want yeah. it to be mine. Right. That's something I say at the beginning of most of my workshops is I don't want you to paint like me. I want you to paint like you, but I can offer you some tools and, and processes that processes, I don't know what that word is, to you know, have a, a springboard to, to find your own voice if you don't have it yet or to add to your repertoire if you're looking for a, just a little jump start. And you have been a wealth of information. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's been a delight talking with you on The Artful Painter. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you also, Carl. Well, did you take a lot of notes today in this episode? I know I did. I am very grateful to Anne Blair Brown for taking the time to talk with us and share her thoughts on the painting process. I especially want to experiment with that 40 brush stroke exercise. That sounds fascinating to me. I think that might help me in developing my skill as a painter. What about you? Was there any takeaway that you particularly enjoyed from this episode? Remember, you can check out Anne Blair Brown's fine art website at Anne, that's spelled A-N-N-E, BlairBrown.com. I have a link in the show notes. Her online training is also available at apaintersjourney.com. So I have links to both of those in the show notes. If you'd like to comment on this, send me an email. All you have to do is go to carlolson.tv, click on the contact tab, and you can fill out that form and that will send me an email with your questions, comments, whatever. I do love hearing from everyone. So if you want to leave a message, ask a question, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, it's encouraging to me. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Artful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.